So we were asked to offer some reflections of our our consortium here, and I wanted to first of all let you know. I don't know if you do know that I've been archiving uh, movement people in particular who have developed somatic approaches. And I had wonderful interviews with Judith and with Bonnie uh, on the Continuum website, as well as Anna and other people as well. So just to tell you that the issue of lineage is critically precious. And we're sitting here in relation to Gabrielle and um, you know, we're not getting any younger, I don't think. We're getting younger. <laughs> <laughs> and so, here we are. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to leave you with some, some thoughts in relation to the inquiry that I've been engaged with. And I wanted to read you, uh, there are two sentences uh, which I didn't write unfortunately, but I had the good sense to put it in here. And what was amazing is that Mircea Eliade, anybody here familiar with him? He was a professor of religious studies, and he uh, wrote a book. He did a tremendous amount of work with tribal uh, symbols and religion, and anyway, he wrote this sentence that to me is... This is it. And the fact that he could put it in one sentence, this whole thing. Okay, so here it is. Message from Merchia Eliai. Immersion in water symbolizes a return to the pre-formal. A total regeneration. A new birth. For immersion means a dissolution of forms, a reintegration into the formlessness of pre-existence, and emerging from the water is a repetition of the act of creation in which form was first expressed. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> what, what page is that on, Emily? Hmm? What page is that on? That's on 247. But what's very interesting, in a certain way, um, uh, before I uh, quote Prigogine, um, <laughs> back in the 70s, I had decided to work with um, my first venture into paralysis was with someone who had polio, and Valerie Hunt at UCLA was doing the research. Valerie Hunt is emeritus. She was a professor of kinesiology, movement behavior at UCLA, and one of the few scientists who were really, you know, passionately interested in movement and of exploring what she didn't know. And so um, I came to her. I had a, a young woman who had polio, and she said, what do you think you're going to do here? I said, well, I <laughs> she said, oh, really? She said, she, said, she said, once a muscle dies, it can't regrow. She said, good thing you don't know anything about anatomy. She said, this is not, you know. She said, what do you want me to research? I said, put down zeros. I said, just put her on the table and put down zeros so that we have a baseline. So she said, well, I'll humor you. So, you know. And then within a certain period of time, uh, this young woman, began, her leg began to move. And I, I actually had the sense to film her. And over a period of time, the, she actually regrew the muscle in her leg. But what was, what was so interesting, and the important part of this, is that she drew fetal drawings, spontaneously drawing embryos and fetal drawings during the whole process that she was in. And I began to see that the, the embryonic spiral whether you're giving birth to a new muscle, new nerve fiber, new whatever it is, is the embryonic spiral, the act of creation in which form was first expressed. So the embryo, spiraled water, is the mandala, the centerpiece of 
of the whole thing, really. Of really entering the zone. In other words, how life happens. The fractal of the embryo. The immensity of billions of years of planetary history shaping itself into this form and being part of that shaping. I saw that film. So incredible. The, you did. the polio film. Yeah, it's very, it, it's, it's amazing. And, and what, I, what happened in that, so I'll just I'll show you with my hand, pretend this is a leg. Okay, so I, what it was is I had seen people putting their hands over people's le- uh, bodies, the healers. So I decided to do that. And so people undulate when I do that. So, because I have a lot of wave in my system, and so her leg started to move on its own. And I said, do you, can you feel your leg moving? And she said, yeah, it is. And there it was. And then over a period of time, it became more and more coherent. And so until she, and Valerie was right there, you know, uh, 110%. And I mean, it's a, you know, it's really important. Um, so thank you for that footage. The other thing that Prigogine said that um, is immensely important he said, when you take a system far from equilibrium, you increase the flow of information. So if we look at it as status quo, when you take a system far from status quo, you increase the flow of information. And what we're talking about is bioinformation. And so the, the issue of a versatile system who can shift in terms of running from tigers, fetch wood, carry water, push off the ground, do all all of these things, and shift circumstance to a different band of, of capability. So one of the things that I wanted to bring into our focus is the ability to innovate that I think in my travels with, um, uh, with scientists and medical people, they're still talking about regeneration. Well, parts of our body do regenerate. But the ability to innovate, to me, is very Western. And I feel an allegiance to developing Western practice that has to do with the kind of cosmology that we live with, not ignoring what has gone before, but to acknowledge the immensity of the dynamic creativity that is in Western culture. So I wanted to, again, say to you, the notion of innovation, let us say that the system can create alternate systems when it has the nutrients to do it. So let's say that there is some kind of fundamental something going on with somebody, uh, some kind of deterioration of some, of some sort. Let's say that an alternate system can be encouraged that I have no cartilage in this knee. I have perfect movement in this leg, et cetera, et cetera. If we x-rayed my knee, I'm sure the cartilage would not be there. But there is an alternate system that has developed in this knee so that I I can move it in any way, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have any problems this and that. The the issue of the creativity, dynamic inquiry, et cetera. But the, the, the caution is that the language, the bio language, is what the organism understands. That you're communicating in the language that it has. And so spiral wave, pulsation, embryo, all of the moving off the earth, all of the, that is what it is. And again, I want to just mention to you just a very tiny little thing of Now, you will not see this coupled. In other words, that what goes on for the most part is 
that things are living in different planets. You know, there's discovery in science, but it's not integrated into, let's say, what we might be inquiring into. And so it stays in another planet, the Petri dish uh, consciousness. Okay, so I just want to mention this to you, that I want to repeat this. The astrocyte is the stem cell of the brain. It is cued through sensation. Now, when it is cued and its character, when they speak about the movement of the astrocyte, it's like an octopus. They always refer to it as this octopus kind of movement. So it, in turn, is cueing calcium waves and mitochondria. Now, you Google it up, and it's there. What it doesn't say is that that is the abundance that we see in the embryo. The implication is that we can summon that level of fertility at any point in our lives. Part of what I feel now, we're at a time where the pressure is on us to become more creative. You know, we could see the glass empty, the glass full. You know, we could see it however you want to see it. But the challenge is incredible. The issue of disempowerment that is floating through the Arab world to Occupy world, again, Occupy the body would be a really good theme. The helplessness. I'm just going to give you one little thing in relation to... Um, you know, we already spoke about bone marrow, that as you go into the, uh, as you keep dropping down and have more fluidity, you start hitting bone marrow, which has an effervescent quality. So the issue of stem cells, the issue of uh, lymphatic capability, immune capability, red blood cells, white blood cells, we have it. It's here. We can do it. Another way of looking at certain things is the issue of cancer cells. <clears throat> From a movement point of view, the cancer cell is completely incoherent. If you, if you looked at uh, people going down the street, if they were cancer cells, they'd be walking on top of each other. There's no spatial relationship. There's no anything with a cancer cell. It's all over the place. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> but what is, what is very interesting is, okay, get this. With a highly coherent system, guess what? The cancer cell can become coherent. So let's just say if there was a group of people who had a highly coherent uh, field and you had a couple of people with, who had cancers, a cancer, the opportunity for the cancer cell to receive that level of coherency is extremely high. So we're talking about a kind of community medicine. We're ta and I had said this before, I feel that the people in the somatics field are the revolutionaries because we don't know anything about how life thrives. The corporate world is dehumanizing increasingly. I mean, I'm sure you know that. And so, how, is, how are these voices to be heard? So each one of you is carrying the lineage and the inspiration of what has gone before. You know, I, and I just want to end up with, um, I had the privilege of listening to Marion Rose and, and Charlotte Selva at a conference a while ago in San Francisco. And it was amazing to sit there listening to these seniors speaking about Germany and speaking, one was Jewish, Marion, and was not permitted to go to school, and Charlotte was Gentile. Char but the, Charlotte actually was Jewish. Was, she was? She was yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Okay. Didn't know that. She didn't say she was, so. I was shocked to learn it. Okay. Well, yeah, she didn't say she was, so that was interesting. Maybe she was passing. But anyway, <laughs> the impression, the impression I had of, of as they were describing their their life before they got to America, was stop. 
we need to become more human. Stop. Stop. This is breathe. Let's breathe. Let's move. Let's feel. Let's, let's awaken. Let's feel what it is to have a body. Let's feel it. Let's feel it. Let's feel it. And they brought that to America. And that duet on uh, a Sunday afternoon in San Francisco was just extraordinary of the, of the, the transmission that was coming. It's the same thing now. It's the same thing. In our lifetimes, we can only go so far. It's a huge subject. It's up to you. <laughs> We're capping on it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear what she said. I, I said, said we're counting saying. on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Do you want to speak? Sure. <laughs> this is a Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday salon. <laughs> we had the opportunity to work with, uh, when we were doing the program at Esalen, Charlotte Silver and Charles and... Robert, Paul, Paul, and all these people were part of the two-year somatic program that we, we worked with, and we had lots of fun in that. We had lots of fun. <clears throat> yeah. um, that's my feeling about this symposium, is that we were invited to share our inspiration, to see if it might trigger some of your inspirations. And I think that's what we're interested in, is that there's some connection like, well, I've been thinking along that line, and I actually wondered, I'm curious if, and the questions come, and then the journey becomes more focused, and suddenly it's very clear. Like people ask me, they say, well, how did you, it seemed like you had so many choices in your life. And I say, you know, it's one of those things where, yes, I would come to a crossroads, and it was clear I had to go right. Next time I went left, then I went up, then I went down, and so on and so forth. And each one led to the, the next one. And Excuse me, Judith, could you just speak a little bit louder? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and... It's one of those things where people will say to me, you must be so proud of what you know. And I say, well, it depends on what direction you're facing. If I turn around and face my past, I'm pleased with what I have learned and how I've been able to assist and improve and become a better person. If I face the future, I know nothing. It's all to be determined in the present. And so the only thing I can do is prepare myself with the ability to feel sensation and to listen to the universal truth and consciousness and get out of the way so I contact that wisdom that is much greater than I, that's here with all your ancestors. That's why I wanted to start there. <clears throat> it's like sometimes don't you feel someone comes in to work with you and you go, many people are standing behind them <laughs> because you're not just working with that person in the family you're working with all their ancestors and as one of the Hawaiian elders said to me the buck stops with you the ancestors are counting on you to help neutralize many of their stories so yeah you have the responsibility wow okay but it seems clear what it is when we learn how to listen, and I think that's what we're doing here that I'm so excited about, is we each have our, our ways that might facilitate a way of listening, a way of listening to the truth. So one of the things that struck me was this piece about, and it, it happened when I was teaching dance and doing choreography. People would say, you know, I can always tell Judy's dancers. They look like her. Right? And I think, that's not good. <laughs> and so when that would happen, that everyone would go into this correct posture when I would walk in, and I would say, that's not good. 
So, for example, just sit here as you are and please get correct. Pull, lift, straighten up yourself. Don't be asymmetrical. Yes, right now, everybody, sit up, for heaven's sakes. Let's go back to the Industrial Revolution. We have the rebels. The point is, feel that this was the bicep girl. She was talking about... Anyway, from here, feel how it squeezes your truth. Truth. It's easy to control a group in tension than it is in their truthful relaxation. And if you relax, you don't have to look around. Can you feel all the people? But when you're on hold, and this is the world going back to the Industrial Revolution, that people were set into these models, and then furniture was designed for them. Shoes were designed for them. Don't tilt the chair when you're in kindergarten. They'd scoot the child back under to be correct. And it was all about right and wrong, based on the no. And what I found through the years, which made me personally sad for myself, as well as all the people I worked with, <clears throat> is that we carried some kind of world shame. And people would come in for their sessions and say, you can see I'm, a, I'm asymmetrical, right? You can tell, you can tell, yeah. No, I know I slump, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can see I have a lot of cellulite. I mean, the bombardment of these no's about not being good enough was something that I've, <clears throat> I felt on a mission, <laughs> holding my flag, to change. And I was thinking back because one of my clients in Colorado uh, I think he lived in Denver, worked for Martin Marietta, the lab there. And he was so incredible. His, his job at Martin Marietta was to see if there was life on Mars. And this would have been around 79, 80, 81, something like that, that he invited me to come. And there was a team of people that took me around the site, and they took me to the MMU unit that was going to be for the substations, and they were asking me things about this chair and about what about you think about this handle for doing... I said, oh, yeah, well, the push there is going to fatigue the, tongue, the thumb and so on and so forth. And I started noticing people behind me. Running Sketch it. I was me. like, they're not inviting me to give them <laughs> ideas that I might be able to design for them. They just want these ideas. <laughs> and then they had arranged for me to speak to the human factors. Do you know human factors is that stuff about the right angle, 90-90-90, wheelchair access, blah, blah. And so they had a 50 people come to hear me that night. It would be like you with the physicians, me with the physicians. <clears throat> and I'm talking and I'm sharing my empirical system. And I hear this gasp in the back of the room. And this woman yells out, you cannot say that. She was visiting from Germany. You cannot say that. You have no research. Who do you think you are to make these gross statements? And it was like... <coughs> so, you know, once I recovered myself, I said, I didn't say I had research. This is an empirical system. These are my findings. So I want to continue the exploration. I appreciate your perspective. Luckily, she was quiet for the rest of the time. But I was shaken. I don't know how I sounded. I've never, I've never really had people throw tomatoes like they did to Merce Cunningham. But, um, uh, but uh, that was my experience of that. And I realized, like you're saying, where do we, we get this strength? The strength is that once you hear the calling, it's hard to deny. And once you're in your truth, you don't need someone to be able to be between you to talk to God or spirit. You don't need someone to tell you how you're supposed to stand. You can be given options, and you can play with it, and you recognize it. And when I would work with people who had been in wheelchairs most of their life, and I would put this wedge here and that wedge there and this pillow here and so on, and they'd say, oh, that's it. And I'd say, have you ever sat like this before? And they'd say, no. And I'd say, well, how do you know it's okay? And they said, I said, 
it's okay, it's good. I said, well, how do you know? And he said, I said, he's right. <laughs> so I said, how do you know? They say, I recognize it. Look at me. Look how much more able I am. And I've worked with people like that where the first thing I do is modify their wheelchair, <laughs> raise the seat, and change the handle. You know, they're sitting like this, talking like this, and raise the seat, lower the handle, and they say, how come no one in 17 years has ever thought of that? Okay. It's a different perspective, and we each have our own. So to contact that place, you know, my belief in this lifetime, while life is challenging, while life is challenging, it provides the, um, the friction to be able to learn from, to become a better person. That's my, my interest. And so as I can listen to what's important and contact what I think is universal truth, that, you know, there are those ancestors and those spirit guides and all those people who are saying, hmm, good work, you're coming along. <laughs> this is good, you listened. Uh, one of the last times, we're, Dina's not here, one of the last times I, I saw Dina, I went to visit her, and I was driving down University Boulevard, and I got the, the message, get off this street. And I turned, and I hadn't been to Berkeley for a long time, and now they have these one ways, and, and you know, I'm trapped, and so on, and I'm going, and I'm going, and I'm going, and I end up back on University, and I'm sitting there for the signal, and someone rear ends me. Okay. So when I spoke, <laughs> next time I saw Bakula, he said, this was so good that you heard spirit say, get off. I said, too bad you didn't ask them when you were supposed to get off. <laughs> <laughs> so there's something to the sequence about listening and paying attention to not just the first thing that we want to hear, <laughs> perhaps. And this comes from this. This is what we have. And to be, to be in this, this world and in this field where it is like birth and growth and expansion and newness that goes all the way back to the oldest, oldest truth is phenomenal. And so that's why I got excited to come was to be part of maybe creating a spark. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to follow that? <laughs> what is this Spark. How do we know? You know, how do we know? You know, how do we know? I know, you know. So, we are facing us, we are facing you. How do you know what you know? And there's all of this. Um, talk about this is how you know no this is how you know oh no <laughs> how do you know what you know oh. how do you know what you know somebody tells you now Judas just said this Emily said this I'm saying this Who's what if we were saying something different? It happens to be we're not. But our approach is very different. It isn't even that different, but let's say it's different. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? Where you grew up, the beliefs of your culture, the time. It's not the lower Middle Ages. It's not the Renaissance. It's not... 
2,500. I'm not very good with numbers, so I got caught there. Um, how do you know? What would carry through all of the 600,000 years, a million years? How, how do we know? Were you born here? Were you born there? In time and space? How old you are? Are you an elder? Are you just born? How do you know? Who are you listening to? What do you mean elders? What do you mean lifetimes? What do you mean God, goddess? How do you know? Oh no. We happen to be living where the philosophies and the religions are made by men, created by men. They are the witches, but you know, they were they were not treated no, so well. And, and, um, who's right? Who's wrong? How do you know? Are you still mad at your mother? You know, how do you know? Your father wasn't there? I don't know. Oh. How do you know what you know? Where do you resource that? <coughs> Is this right? I didn't get that, Bonnie. Could you... Could you show me how to do that? I would like to help you find it, but I can't give you my experience. It's not possible. I can give you my, I can share my experience, but you have to have your own. How do you find it? Who do you listen to? What? I remember the day that God died. I was 21, and I went out on a ledge. And I stopped to think before I jumped. And the only thing that brought me back out of that window was my mother, and I knew it would destroy her. And how I came back was I said, I don't know anything. I'm here, but any moment I can live or die. I might as well live and see what happens. How do we know and what guides us? What is the thing that you go, I don't know anything, or I know everything, and you better know the same thing? Or, or we have to go to war. Or we can't teach this because of that thing. Or we, I don't want you influencing. Aren't you afraid to do what you do? I don't know how many people have said that in the early years. Now there are enough people here that we can have a profession, a field. But I remember students saying to me, aren't you afraid to do that? I didn't see her again. She chose another path. And I trusted her knowing. So when you said, we're counting on you, I'm not actually counting on you at all. I'm doing my bit. You have to count on yourself. Of course, I hope. You know, I lie. I, of course, I would like you to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because really, I mean, I didn't know Gabrielle very well. We danced one time many years ago. But we're, we're travelers along the same path. So I feel her passing, and I thought, how wonderful. When I die, I would love people to dance and sing and celebrate their living and their knowing through dance and song. And then I think somewhere a long time ago, sing a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. A man said it a long time ago. <laughs> But he knew something there. Maybe he heard it from his sister. <laughs> I and how do you trust what you know? Because maybe no one around you agrees. Or maybe the person in the back says, You can't say that. 
who are you to say something different than all the great masters? Whether they be scientists, yogis, uh, religious leaders, it's not serious. How do we say something? And I think of these people that are in danger and they are willing to be in danger for what they know. we can say pretty much what we want. Pretty much. But where are you going to say it? Here is a good place. <laughs> so I would just say, how do you know, how do you trust what you know to be who you are? Not who you've been told who you should be how you should act, or who's telling you what to do. I happen to feel presence. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's my ancestors. I don't know if it's the, the circle of mm, But I know I feel presence. I feel connected to the lineage of life, maybe to the stars. I don't know. I don't know where I came from. I don't know where I'm going. But I know that I'm coming and going. <laughs> what I really know is that we're here today. We're just here. Whatever terrific thing has happened in our life, good or bad, or whatever will happen later in our life, good or bad, it doesn't exist. But it exists. accept all the ways of different knowings. How do we sit with, that doesn't fit what I feel, therefore it's wrong. Or that doesn't fit with what I feel. How do you feel that? How do you know that? Uh, many years ago, it's not so many, no, we're not that old. Um, I could have been born in 1982. It's not very long. And we were at a final seminar of a train, two year training, and uh, uh, this one man and this one woman got into a terrific disagreement, argument. They were really arguing, but just disagreement. I was, you know, the moderator, I'm the teacher, right? I'm thinking, oh my God, all these two years, and listen to them, they're like, you know, strange. I thought, you know, I don't have to do a damn thing. <laughs> they have the right to disagree. And I thought, all they, whatever their ancestors, whatever their life, whatever it was, they weren't going to agree for a long, long time. <laughs> and they had the right. And I had the right to just be there and enjoy <laughs> and learn about how they knew what they knew. And I didn't have to solve anything. I didn't have to create peace. I didn't have to be a, ma a what do you call it, a person who helps people, mediator, mediator. I could just sit there and hold the space for them to argue. They weren't going to kill each other. They also cared for each other, but they were never going to agree. And I, they freed me. So you are free. We are free to be me in whatever form that is in this lifetime. And I thank Gabriel for living her life in this time. creating an environment in which I can live more easily. And may we all create a life for each of us to live more easily in our own knowing. Whatever that is.
Judas said, how do you know yourself? Because you know yourself. When you don't know who you are, and that's part of the knowing.